Oh, actually, I should probably make an introduction. Trish, this is Joe. Joe, this is Trish. <laughs> Hi, Trish. You're right. Yeah, I think both of you have been. Today, I hear. Yes, yeah. I'm going to be your slide, your slide driver. <laughs> <laughs> I think both of you have heard about each other actually for yeah. <laughs> a little curious conversation. So it's good to meet. We'll give everybody just a minute or so still. I know that we had a little bit of a little bit of scheduling issues, but Okay, I mean, it's 2.30. I suspect people will start kind of rolling in as, as it were. So we can go ahead and make a start. I just wanted to give a little intro. I'm Andrea Marla with the Cardiovascular Networks and so grateful for all of you to be here today because I know we've had some scheduling issues. So um, thank you for taking the time uh, to join us. Um, I just wanted to give a quick introduction to my colleague, who is Joe Wood. So some of you may have remember, may be aware, of course, that Sally Ann Holman has left the networks to pursue another uh, position. Joe has helpfully taken her place and will be working on this work stream. So you will see a lot more of him. Um, he comes from North Central London CCG prior to this, and he has a strong background in public health working in government and public health England um, and also some global health work. So we're really grateful for him to be on the team. So I'm going to pass it over to Joe to take on. I think somebody's got their um, their microphone not muted. So if we could all just check, that'd be great. But Joe, I'm going to pass it over to you. Thanks so much. Cool. Thank you, Andrea. And hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming today. It's nice to meet you. Do you it's, we're quite a small group. Do you guys know each other? Do we want to do a little quick round of intros or? Should we go for it? I'm going to say go for it just so I can, because uh, obviously if I'm seeing some of you guys going forwards, it might be good to say hello quickly. Um, I'll just go around as people uh, on my screen. So Cynthia, would you like to go first? Oh, you're on mute, Cynthia. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm nice. Cynthia Danso. I'm the Arrhythmia nurse at Lewisham and Greenwich Trust. Um, it's myself and my colleague. I'm not sure whether she's joining today, so I'm sure. Oh, brilliant, thank you. Um, Ernest? Hi, um, my name is Ernest um, Aduma. Um, I'm a new Arrhythmia nurse in Epsilon and St. Helia Hospital. And I've got Clara with me here. Show your face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so she hasn't got a um, speaker on her on her headphone. Yeah, there she is. Yeah. <laughs> so we are together with um, um, Arrhythmia Nurses uh, for Epstein and St. Helia Hospital. Cool, brilliant. Thanks, Beth. Um, Shaya? Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear you? Hi, I'm Shoya, I'm one of the Arrhythmias at Kingston Hospital. And I'm going to butt out in a minute because I'm doing clinic as well. It's just that my 2.30 hasn't turned out. <laughs> okay. Well, it's good to have you with us for as long as you're around. Thanks. Uh, Nicola? 
Hi, I'm Nikki. I'm one of the arrhythmia nurses at Kingston Hospital as well. Uh, Julia? Do you mean Julianne? Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, I see okay. the, end, the ends are dot, dot, dot. I don't want to butt in. Um, I'm Julianne. I'm the only um, arrhythmia nurse here at the Princess Royal under the King's umbrella. Um, so it's just me. Uh, Stephen? Hi, yeah, my name's Steve Walker. I'm one of the arrhythmia nurses at uh, Guy's and St Thomas's. I'm in a team with uh, two other um, nurses, one who, who, of whom is not here and the other's on a call. So I'll be representing us today. Brilliant, thanks. And Clara. Sorry, I haven't got a um, headphone earlier oh. introduced myself and yeah, work with oh, uh, uh, in Epsom St. Helia. Apologies, I think the list okay. keeps moving up and down. Cool. And uh, I'll introduce Trish in a sec. But before we get into the uh, presentation, just a couple of um, usual Teams webinar rules. If you could just keep your mics on, on mute uh, during the presentation, we should have plenty of time for questions and comments at the end, um, which handle in the normal way if you give us a uh, a virtual hand or we're probably a small enough group you can probably give us a literal wave as well um also feel free to stick any uh, comments or questions into the chat box um this session is being recorded as the banner says at the top we take your attendance as consent uh, but that's okay to be in the recording of course feel free to to stick your cameras off if you don't want to be uh, too visible um and yeah we'll be able to to share a link uh, to be recording after the session, uh, either Andrea or myself will, will send that round. Cool. Um, so yeah, today we have uh, Patricia Tarabelli, uh, Tarabarelli, sorry, coming from Imperial College, um, where she's running a high volume tilt service. Uh, prior to becoming a cardiac nurse, Tricia was a sociologist working in the field of health, illness and medicine, and her PhD centred on longitudinal ethnographic study of familial caregivers with dementia. So Trish, it's really great to have you with us today. Um, do you want to say hello quickly whilst I bring your slides up? Hello there, thanks for having me. It's um, thanks for the invitation and uh, I feel as if I'm gone back south of the river because I uh, I did my rotation at Guys and Tommy's and I trained I think practically in every trust been at King's in south of the river apart from Kingston so um, it's like going back into going back where I started a bit. Um, OK, so. Uh, I suppose I was asked to talk about uh, syncope and its management, which is a huge area, so I had to think about what to do, but. Can I just go to the next slide, please, Joe? Sorry, it's going to be a bit, uh, bit painful. Um, and I'm always reminded of an old teacher that every time people st would start to give a presentation, they'd say and definitions. And this teacher would say, oh, must we really go through this? Um, I suppose what I'm saying is we are not uh, looking at if somebody is unresponsive for an hour, um, you can read it. I'm not going to go through and read, read things. You know, if somebody's unresponsive for an hour without any trauma, that's unlikely to be syncope, cardiac or otherwise. Um, and it's not the um, I've lost track of time and space for a week. We had an instance where we call it eat in the fridge syncope, where somebody presented to one of our clinics with as a syncopal patient, um, as a referral to syncopal patient. But basically he, had, he couldn't remember the last week. His wife had gone off to Ireland to visit family. He couldn't remember the last week, but somebody had eaten all the food in the fridge. Uh, but he, I mean, sort of, that wasn't cardiac syncope either or vasovagal either. So we're looking for a sort of uh, hyperperfusion characterized by rapid onset, short, short duration and complete recovery. Okay. Next slide, please, Jim. So what was my brief? What was I going to do? Sometimes when you're given a specific brief, it's 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 a bit tricky. And when you're given like knock yourself out and do what you want to do, that can be equally tricky. Um, hopefully, um, I've sort of focused on the identification and management of syncope, how we do that, um, and also on the importance of, of how pathophysiology and understanding the causes of syncope really should underpin so much of what we do in terms of history taking, um, I, you know, diagnosis, but also management planning and um, promoting well-being in a new patient. 
Um, so hopefully I'll I'll do that with a few diversions. So it might stop the death by PowerPoint or these days death by PowerPoint by Teams. Um, and may perhaps raise a few things which might be a bit debatable or just might get us, it's sort of you just thinking really about what we do and the patients that we see. And uh, I just hopefully I don't bore the pants off you all by doing that. OK, next slide. So the get out, my get out of jail card is that if anybody doesn't know this, there's a, our latest guidance, I suppose, is still from 2018. Um, and it's not such a painful document. That's right. Our guidelines of diagnosis and management of syncope. Uh, what could be more sexy than that? Um, but it's actually not too painful. It's pretty comprehensive. And I think it's it's a, a testament really to some of the quite eminent authors that, that were involved in it, that it is quite accessible. So I'll draw on a couple of things, but that's your sort of backdrop for anybody. I mean, it may be that I'm talking to people who've been in the field for you know 20 years and it's a bit beyond them. It might be people who are relatively new. So uh, I think it's a really good introduction for to, to the sort of backdrop of what I'm going to be touching on today. Next slide, please. So. Just a sort of a bit of a, not a pop quiz, but just a few. Uh, interesting facts, I suppose. Um, I once worked with, a, well, I once interviewed um, a cardiac specialist in who told me that he didn't see much syncope in his trust. And I was a bit surprised um, by that. Um, so um, it's, you can see it's uh, at least about 1.5% of uh, a &E attendances. 50% uh, of those patients are admitted. Um, there's an element of trauma. Um, it can, uh, hospitalization accounts for about 75%. I don't know how long it's going to. Guys, could we please go on mute? Sorry, I can't see who it is, but uh, <laughs> might need to do some self policing. Trish, are you still with us? Sorry, you still with me? Uh, I can hear you, you hear now. Me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, what yeah. What was the last thing I said that you heard? Ooh, I'm not sure. It's when I um, oh. asked people to go on mute. So <laughs> if you carried on talking, I think right. we might okay. that bit. So yeah, so it, it's costly. What I'm particularly uh, focused on here is, is the um, the number of tests that patients typically have. And I think that's been borne out by audits that we've done. ILRs, the introduction of ILRs hopefully will count. But what you find is, and you may have come across this, people will have numerous halters. And they, you know, while you're in the diagnostic process, you just keep on repeating the same with sometimes little yield. Um, and the patients visit on average three different specialists and have 13 inconclusive tests before the diagnosis is made. Um, I tend to be, especially in the tilt room, I would probably be one of the last clinicians that people see. And very often it's quite, it's very typical for people to have been, you know, get GP all through cardiology, all through neurology, maybe through another physician and then actually come for you know their final diagnostic test which might prove fruitful so it's expensive and it can be expensive to the nhs but it's also expensive to patients and it has a cost to patients that sometimes we forget okay uh, so this cost that i'm referring to if you go on to the next slide please is that taking a poor history or lack of understanding of history lack of early and clear treatment has significant impact on even the low risk patients. And I'll sort of talk about the difference between high risk and low risk as we go through um, cost to patients. Um, and then some studies have, have drawn a comparison that the sort of uh, quality of life impact and psychological impact on some of these patients is equivalent to patients who have, who have suffered with cancers. Um, so the question is why? We're not, I think many, if you go to uh, HRC, for example, there's a repeated refrain that we're perhaps not very good at dealing with syncope. And the question is why? Next slide. So I've got a few couple of theories about this. 
One is I think is that it's so much of the guidelines and so much of the guidance that you're given does, does depend on your understanding, the quality of your understanding of the causes and pathophysiology of syncope. Um, it also depends on our clinical gaze. What do I mean that? You know, my boss always says you go to a if you go to a barber, you get a haircut. So if you go to a neurologist, they're focusing on, you know, is this person epileptic? What's the neurological side of that? If you go to, if you're an arrhythmia nurse, you're focusing on, on a cardiac syncope. Um, we all look at our patients through a particular gaze and what we're looking for and also what we're focused on. Um, and I suppose in cardiology is, or in A&E specifically, you know, is this person going to drop dead if I discharge them? Is there something I'm really scared of? They're looking for the red flags. Um, the quality of our communication is often key. We're taking a history in all of this, and that's often set in dependence. And we all know it's very difficult to give a full, take a full history, never mind get an understanding sometimes in the 10 minutes you get for clinic or in a busy A&E. Um, and finally, it might be a little more contentious, it's what value are we placing on the other 75% of syncope patients that are non-cardiac syncope? Um, I think there's an implicit um bias i think in 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 how we approach this so the understanding is important you know uh, a, a pacemaker is not going to cure cough syncope uh, a pacemaker doesn't is not a cure all for example um but these sorts of understandings what we understand by syncope and the, and the causes and how we can treat them impacts all of this so the next uh slide please okay so how do we rank the cause of syncope how do we what's the most uh, prevalent and how do we uh what do we spend most of our energy looking at so with this particular slide just to explain it the scheme is um well as you can see by the by the yellow um figures Structural and cardio, I suppose that's arrhythmia nurses. Many of most of your time might be taken up with the cardioarrhythmias and the structural cardiopulmonary causes of syncope. And that that's up to 15% of the patients that we see. 10% will never ever find out what the problem is. Um, but then you've got the orthostatic causes, but that could be drug induced. Uh, and again, I'll touch on this again a little bit later. Uh, or the, the primary and secondary autonomic nervous system failures. And by far the greatest is this new category called the neurally medicate, um, med mediated, not medicated. Right. So it's vasovagal syncope, the carotid sinus uh, sensitivities, situational cough, uh, and post maturation syncopes. So that comes for 60% of that. Um, and I think sometimes the problem is that how well do we deal with these, you know, 75% uh, of the patients really that can develop sometimes long term problems unexpectedly. So how do we identify and how do we risk assess syncope? Again, my boss, Dr. Uh, Boon Lim, who I've worked with now for over 10 years, it's history, history, history. And I'm sure that you um, have been told the same thing. But again, that history and how we take history depends on how we're viewing the patient, our understanding of the pathophysiology and uh, what we see as, as our, our, our primary, um, what's most important to us and what we think is important or not. This should be, of course, be a physical examination. So we're looking for aortic stenosis. We're sort of, you know, putting hands on the patient, listening, um, and their history in terms of, you know, any sign of heart failure, uh, loud murmurs, exactly PE, and a line of standing blood pressure. The success of a line of standing blood pressure, I think, in practice is a bit hit and miss. Um, I find it difficult sometimes to get our own patient nurses to do a proper one. So, you know, good luck everywhere else sometimes. Um, 12 lead ECG, clearly. Um, and I think there's an estimate that a good 63% of cases can be diagnosed successfully with a good history and, and the ECG of that. Uh, and not necessarily you need 30, uh, 30 tests. So the 2018 guidance offer a, a nifty flow chart, as you might expect. So we go to the next uh, slide. So again, this is something you can peruse at your, at your leisure. But OK, this is where I might go off piste a little bit. So we're looking at, you know, is there a, a transient loss of consciousness? Uh, they helpfully say it's not transient, so they never actually passed out in the first place. Uh, yes, there's syncope involved. Yes, there's a transient loss of consciousness, but it's not syncopal. 
And in that category, they put epileptic seizure. Fine, that's not our department. Although, you know, I think the the, the places where they have syncope units that have a multidisciplinary team going through A&E &E, uh, would be ideal, but we certainly don't have that imperial. Um, rare causes, which is very helpful, isn't it? If you don't know what the rare causes are, but I'm going to just take a moment to look at psychogenic um, pseudosyncope, what it's called sometimes. Um, recognising that it's not always as simple as it seems. And I wondered, you know, putting it out to you, how many of you are have come across it or would be confident in in diagnosing a possible psychogenic case? It's hard to do. It's hard to do interactive work on on this stage. But does anybody would anybody feel very confident and know what they were looking for? Everybody's at tea. OK, that's fine. Um, right, so I think very few people are, and I think especially in cardiology, even the cardiologists aren't, um, they sort of shunt that along. And it might be might be mooted about functional or nothing to do with us or probably just anxious, but they don't certainly don't, uh, I think, are very confident or will very clearly document that, or, uh, that that's what they think it is or even discuss it with the patient. Um, so what is it and how would we diagnose it? So psychogenic syncope is not pretending to faint. I think in all the thousands of patients that I've tilted in the last 10, 12 years, I have, I've only ever had two patients pretend to faint um, or collapse with me. Psychogenic syncope isn't that. It's the patient, very often, actually in most cases, patients are fainters. They do have an underlying issue. Um, but they generally believe that they are losing consciousness during these events. OK, and one of the, I think, uh, major red flag for us to use that phrase is when somebody has multiple, multiple episodes of syncope, which tends to, skip, tends to scare the producers out of people. And that's where we get the second and the urgent referrals. But that's a bit of a red flag to us when somebody's having 15 um, episodes a week or even a day sometimes. So. How do we know that? Well, one of the good one of the uh, ways that we often use um, to explore that, even if we've got an inkling of it, apart from the history, et cetera, and talking to the patient is by tilt. So if I can just have the next slide. So again, Joe, can I have the next slide come up, please? Thank you. Right. So I don't know if anybody's used to seeing tilt data, probably not. This is a, a trace for a tilt test. And what you're looking at is basically a beat by beat blood pressure on the top. So it's a continuous blood pressure, but like an arc line. And the bottom, you've got a, a continuous ECG monitor. The bottom is, is respiration. Don't worry about that. And at the bottom, you've got time of oh, the time uh, and uh, obviously the, the, the numerical value on the side. So these lines that you see, the first line or right to the left, this is what I could have done with doing the pointer myself, is after five minutes of lying down, the patient is stood, has been stood up to a 60 degree position. OK. And the subsequent lines are when the patient tells us they're symptomatic or when we do something. So at 20 minutes, if you look down the bottom, when you get to see the 25, we're well, around about the 24, 25 minute mark at the bottom, that's when we would have given GTN provocation at this point, just to further challenge the blood pressure. But these other little markings beforehand are when the patients perhaps said they're dizzy or they're tired or seeing pink elephants, whatever that is. And then you can see after this 24 minute mark, you can see the heart rate go up and that's that res response to GTN. And then you can see that this collapse pattern and collapse in the blood pressure and in the heart rate. And that is where the patient like, loses consciousness. OK, well, so what? That's told us the patient is a fainter, perhaps the most common type of fainter that we see. However, if we go to the next slide, please, Joe. What you actually see is that actually that was the second time they had a loss of consciousness or what we would call a loss of consciousness. And where you see loss of consciousness one, this is where the patient slumped and became unresponsive. But as you can see, I'm a cruel witch and I don't actually put them down at that point. So we just continue. So this is what I was trying to explain to people that, that very often these patients are fainters. They do have something, but this uh, loss of consciousness or one is a psychogenic event that you can see that and it's sometimes a very good way of then using that trace to discuss what you found with the patient 
um, in terms of the difference between a cardiovascular collapse and a faint and what they may be experiencing. And very often the patients will say the difference between I get no warning with loss of consciousness type one, but I get a warning with loss of consciousness type two. OK, um, so I was a little bit of an aside just to stop you falling asleep. So to go back to the next slide, please, Joe. We're looking at the uh, back to this stratification model. So once you've got the ECG and you're thinking, OK, there's something not right here. This is definitely syncope. It's not it's not uh, psychogenic. It's not epilepsy. Um, but we're not quite sure what it is. And then you start to investigate what you're focusing on then is is, you know, can I let this person out of A&E? Can I send them home? Um, do I need to admit them? What's going on? Um, and then we're looking for uh, the various high risk or low risk um, assessments. Um, it's interesting what you call high risk. So the next slide, this is probably your bread and butter, and I view this as your bread and butter as arrhythmia nurses. So if you forgive me, I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on this. <laughs> you know. So we're looking at basically red flags. Was it during exertion? Was it supine? Now, this is where the devil's in the detail here. Um, I get we get referrals a pa with, uh, you know, a patient um, um, had a syncopal episode during exercise, which is a red flag. And then actually, when you listen, you pay attention and you've got the time to actually do a, a thorough history. It was after they exercise. So they've just got off the treadmill. They've just been subbed in soccer. Um, soccer, where did that come from? That's a very American thing. In football, they just got subbed off their football match. And they sat down and they started to feel pre-syncable and they passed out. So again, you can see there's a difference in, in the in the detail, understanding what exactly you're looking for rather than hearing exercise and then panicking. And the same thing with, you know, um, syncope while supine. Um, were they actually, you know, lying in bed, had been lying in bed for 10 minutes, talking to the other half and suddenly they lose consciousness? Or had they been actually pre-syncable beforehand, they lay down and then they passed out? Or they sat down, but they're still upright and they've passed out. So this is why it's understanding exactly what you're looking for is so important to the, you know, the devil's in the detail here. But clearly there's a whole series of ECG findings that you're looking for, sudden cardiac death is history, structural disease, etc. Um, right. Um, next slot. OK, so the next slide, we're looking at the more low risk. Uh, so low risk in terms of cardiac death, can I let them home today? Not necessarily in terms of the prognosis or in terms of the patient experience going forward, in terms of what we need to be interested in. Um, so low risk uh, features, you know, yes, they have a prodroma warning. Once that we recognise they're lightheaded, they feel warm, etc. Um, they were, you know, standing on the hot tube. How many times have we come across that? during a meal or after a meal, cough, defecation, you know, the situational syncopes, rotating the head left and right. Well, that is might be a low risk in terms of they won't drop dead tomorrow or today, but, you know, potentially that is a dangerous thing that needs investigating. And this idea of this postural change, which is another feature that we tend to sort of calm down when we come across that in history. Um, the cough syncope in itself, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's supposed to the risk. It's not going to nothing's going to happen today if I discharge them. But clearly, if they're driving, you may want to be you might want to tell them about that. They shouldn't be driving if you suspect cough syncope. And in fact, it's probably one of the only it probably is actually the only form of um, non cardiac syncope that the DVLA will um, will probably stop somebody driving for. Um, OK, so bearing in mind what we know about red flags and, and, and uh, green flags, if we looked at this particular scenario here of a 23 year old, fit, healthy young man, had frequent bouts of childhood episodes, syncope, always preceded by at least two minutes of prodromal warning, uh, rapid recovery, a bit nauseous afterwards, triggered by warm environments, or if he's been standing a long time, he's at the gym, he's working out, he was, has had a long, uh, long set of night um, work nights. Um, he's showered, he's felt lightheaded, sweaty, nauseous, he sat on the floor and then he's lost consciousness. And uh, his mate said that he saw about 40 seconds of shaking movement. OK, and that he was concerned that they, he was fitting um, before coming around after about three minutes. OK, 
Should we? Shall I put this out to the group again? Are they going to answer me back, or are you going to be quiet again? Are we? Would we be worried about this person, or would there bits that we'd be worried about? Yeah. Bits that we wouldn't be worried about? All right, okay. But because she was in contact with patients, Kathy had to call her. But to be honest, I wasn't really in their office. I was in and out all day. Yeah. I don't have any suggestions, but Sancho, could you go on mute, please? Okay, right. Uh, let's, I'll, I'll take on. So, what I would say is that um, what's in green here would be seen as a low risk. Okay, he's there's a childhood fate, there's a good, there's, he's got form, um, he has warning, it's a, a recognizable prodrome. Um, you know, he bit sat down, he's light headed. The thing you might be more concerned about maybe is this shaking movement and this possibility that somebody's having a fit. OK, so uh, if we look at the next slide, what we did with this young man is that we. Um, we um, tilted them. And what you can see here was that after what 28 minutes, so just after GTN, look what happens to the blood pressure and the heart rate. And so what you can see actually in real time when you when you expand that was about he had a probably around about 50 second asystole, which is a strong cardio inhibitory response in effect. It's still faint, but it's a strong cardio inhibitory response. And what you often see in this in this scenario is somebody raise their arm, head back, eyes open. They might be making noises because they blocked their airway, perhaps, and they can they can move. And people see this and they see this as a think that's a fit, um, but it's more of an anoxic response to a you know some drop in blood pressure and heart rate. And you will come back as he did. Um, Full disclosure, this case is actually a little bit more complicated than that, but essentially it did show that that it shows that when you're looking at that um, scenario, you might think so much green, 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 and then something more, maybe more amber, if not red. Um, and but, you know, you need to understand what the possibility of uh, what it could be to uh, to help explore and investigate. So. What we've seen so far is that if you look at the next slide, thanks, um, Joe, is that Patients often tend to be frequently over investigated um, because the success of all these models depend on knowledge, a really good historian, um, a skillful clinician, um, and somebody sometimes has got the um, confidence not to, you know, um, order every possible test uh, under the sun, but to understand what they're looking for. And that's why this was in, in the last I suppose, five or six years, there's been a royal advocacy of multidisciplinary syncope units where um, you may have a, 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 a neurology nurse and a cardiology nurse working together and going into, um, but even as a virtual um, review, but going into a and E's and trying to so identify patients really quickly and get them diagnosed uh, more efficiently. OK, so the next uh, section, I suppose, is looking at and how understanding the pathophys pathophysiology. Sorry, can we go back down to should be slide 22, Jeff? Next one along. Wonderful. OK, so understanding what causes syncope or syncopes, I should say, um, helps us to take a history because it helps us to ask the right questions, plan the diagnostics and interpret them, and importantly, helping your understand, uh, helping your patient understand. The thing that's most telling, I think, about the way we manage syncope so far from like the A and E side and early referral, is that if you look at the nice guides, for example, once you get to the point where you think, oh, this patient is a fainter, or it might be cough syncope, or whatever. The guidance stops. It doesn't tell you what to do with these patients, and then it just diverts to the arrhythmics and the cardiac syncope. Um, so we do have very that's, that's sort of the other seventy five percent. What do we do? Those patients are the ones that will keep coming back to A and E. They will keep hurting themselves. They will not be able to manage things. They will lose their job. Marriages do break down. You hear some horrendous stories because they are the low risk patients that we don't have to worry about or explain things to. So I suppose I'm using this as a bit of a, a soapbox, really, for the other 75%. Um, right, so the guidance, the 2018 guidance, if we go to the next slide, gives this beautifully 
a concise representation of what we're looking at. So at the center, you do have, yes, global hy cerebral hyperperfusion. It could be to do with, uh, on the right hand side, low cardiac output because of an arrhythmia, because of heart failure, because of a structural reason. Um, it could also be, if you look on the left hand side, low peripheral resistance. Um, so basically the pipe work isn't working um, and you've got structural. So then as you go out, you can see the different sort of causes. It could be volume depletion, it could be venous pooling, but it could be uh, the autonomic system not responding appropriately or a reflex syncope. That's great, but it doesn't really promote understanding on the shop floor and it certainly doesn't help our, uh, our patients. So it would be lovely if we could just sort of photocopy that, hand it off to our patients and say, off you go, never to be seen again, don't come back to us. Um, it's not, yeah, it's not going to work. So, we have the next patient, uh, the next um, slide, please, Joe. I'm going back to basics, and this is, I suppose, what I'm giving you is a little bit of a an insight of how I approach um, when I'm thinking or when I've got a patient in front of me and I'm trying to understand what's going on and which questions to ask, but also how I explain it to my patients. Okay, and hopefully, help them to understand how to manage their symptoms and to avoid them. So back to basics, it's all about fighting gravity. I think that sometimes we forget. Uh, I don't know about you, but I think until I, to be honest, until I came into, the, into this role, I really wasn't thinking about the fact that we have a design fault as human beings. We spent all our time with a head for this point north and gravity works on us like everything else and the blood wants to head south into our feet. OK, so the whole of the point about our, our blood pressure is fighting gravity. And that's, I think, that's how I sort of frame it with our patients, rather talk about vagus nerves and cardiovascular status and all the rest of it. So Mother Nature's plan to fight gravity is one, the cardiovascular system and the autonomic nervous system. So next slide, please, Joe. So taking us back to our, you know, student nurse days. Whereas what's our blood pressure breaking it down is cardiac output against peripheral vascular resistance. Uh, and cardiac output is stroke volume, how much the heart is pumping out each time against the heart rate. But we tend to forget, I think, the peripheral resistance part of this equation. And I want you to focus on that a little bit more. And the next slide, we look at a reminder of the autonomic system. And this is where you sort of your heart slumps when you see something like this because it's so busy. But luckily, you have it to take away with you and to, you know, peruse it this evening so you'll be fine. So essentially your autonomic system is this Wizard of Oz in your head that's controlling your blood pressure, your heart rate, your sweating mechanism, your gut, your temperature control, your it, it, it controls all the background things and it's also our subconscious in a sense and it controls our blood pressure. We have two sides of it, one side that speeds everything up, the go faster stripe, the tighten everything up, uh, the digest and the other side, the parasympathetic side on the right, which is gets you to relax, to chill, to digest um, and to slow down. And. Well, hopefully, since nobody's fainting at the moment, I hope that's beautifully aligned. And in most of us, it's, it does a beautiful job for the vast, vast, vast majority of our life. But in about 40 percent of people, it doesn't. And there's some mismatch and or a bit certainly more rock and roll rather than seamless transition against gravity. So next slide, please. So what happens when we stand up? OK, um, just going to take you through the sort of the, the, the main points. If you start at the bottom, I'm going to use the tilt up, but this is essentially when we stand up. When we stand up, about half a litre of blood drops down. We have venous pooling in our guts, in our peripheries. Um, our, there's less blood coming back to the core and back to the heart. Our stroke volume dep depletes and our bearer receptors are picking up on this change, sends the message back north to the brain, uh, which sends out adrenaline. And we go to the next slide here. Whoops. Next slide, there we go. Hang on, she went 32. You can go back for me. Go back again. There we go. So on this slide, so if we look on the right side here, this the uh, the messages go, so norepinephrine and adrenaline goes out and through the renin angiosterone and aldosterone system, um, we, uh, our, our blood volume, we try and push the blood back up north, we vasoconstrict, 
um, our stroke volume goes up, our heart rate goes up, and we're trying to get more blood back. And that's what beauty goes on every time we stand up, blood heads south, and basically our base, you know, our, our vessels constrict, our heart rate goes up, but it should be all be beautifully aligned and controlled. So then our next slide is what goes wrong. OK, and I'm going to give you sort of the way I explain it typically to my patients or medical students or registrars or everybody else's. Um, OK, now we've got different. So so if I just click, if you just click once for me, Joe. Right, OK, so I explain it as your body being like a central heating system and you've got uh, you've got the pump, which is your heart. Essentially, if something goes wrong with that. If the, if the heart doesn't respond to the efforts to go faster, um, and that tends to happen in our older patients sometimes who are chronotropically um, challenged, you're not that you're going to have problems. OK, if you're on a beta blocker, you might think about blood, you're going to have problems potentially. Uh, if there's a structural problem with the heart, these are the sorts of things we'd be looking at. But so there's a pump, but it's not the only part of this puzzle. We focus on this. It's not the only part of the puzzle. So if you press again, please, Joe. So the next set is the pipe works. So remember, as I said to you, the blood is pooling into these huge reservoirs of blood in the gut and the legs. Um, now, what can go wrong here? Well, if we have one of the things that like it depends what you're looking for. So, yes, do the patients have varicose veins? So the venous return is impaired. Um, are they diabetic? So the, mes the messages are going to the vessels, but they're not really responding. Are they quite uh, are they hypermobile? Are they bendy? Do they have conditions like EDS where you know, their vessels are just like the same way they got interconnected tissues are very flexible and they're double jointed. They have vessels that say, come on down when they stand up and the blood will pool a lot more. Um, in the heat, your vessels will dilate more. So these are sort of things you need to be thinking about when you're looking at the history and also when you're trying to explain to the patient about why they may have had issues or continue to have issues. Um, certain drugs again. With men, tamsulosin are always a key thing where they suddenly people start to feel dizzy. Think about the venodilators. Think about the medications that we give to interfere with the natural anti-gravity shield. Um, it might be fine with the GP and we're monitoring their blood pressure, um, but when they're up and walking around, it might be a different thing altogether. So it's the pipe work I'm looking, I'm focusing on. OK, uh, the third one, OK, is your water pressure. OK, your stroke volume. You can't, there's no point pacing an empty heart. So it's all about fluid depletion. Uh, did they sweat? Did they bleed? Have they not drunk anything? Oh, I only have one cup of tea a day, nurse, but I do get thirsty. I do get dizzy when I stand up. This is the sort of thing we're focusing on here. What are the diuretics doing? Um, you know, these are it's it's to do with water pressure. So, you know, if like you're at home with the patient, you've got the pump. If the pump's not working, nothing's going to happen. If you've sprung a leak, nothing's going to happen. If your, you know, the, the, your boiler makes this god awful clanking noise um, because you, there's the water pressure is low, you're going to have an issue. And then the final part of the puzzle is this wizard of Oz, literally, in, uh, that is your brain, your subconscious, that's control controlling all of this. Okay. Um, and this is, I think, I'll, I'll move on to discuss a little bit more. So that's how I tend to think about and describe it. Think in terms of this anti gravity. What's happening to the uh, the heart? Is it emptying out? What's happening to the brain? Why are you feeling the way you feel? Um, a couple of interesting slides here. The this is a, a chart that looks at the response of standing up as we age. And if you see the 80, the green one is the uh, 80 plus contingent. So when you stand up, yes, you have this response, which should be beautifully aligned and responding back very, very quickly. Look how long it takes the 80 year old to make that sort of adjustment. Um, for all sorts of reasons, maybe it's medication, maybe it's time, maybe it's diabetes, etc. But there's a definite age relationship there. And the next slide is the impact of different medications. And in particular, the red line is the effect of beta blockers. And I think if you talk to any of the gerontologists, um, they will um, have a lot to say about how we use beta blockers and how we um, especially the elderly population who will fall. They won't necessarily complain of feeling dizzy or syncopal. Uh, they'll deny it, in fact, but they are falling because of um, because of an orthostatic or cardiac problem. And it's just it, I think what this chart does is give you um, an appreciation of of, uh, of how it can impact that uh, that orthostatic side of it when we when we employ beta blockers in particular in that age group and how strict we are with um, maintaining certain um, 
uh, levels of, of blood pressure as well. So let's take it back. Right, so what happens when this doesn't work? This is beautifully aligned. It's working fine with us. What happens if it doesn't? You just go to the next slide, please. OK, if they fail, right, we end up fainting. So the body basically reboots us uh, and typically it will give us warning. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Hypertension is usually accompanied by symptoms of prodromal warning that we have to take time to educate our patients to understand because they will always think that they're expecting a huge banner to be put up by the brain to say in 10, 9, 8, and you're not going to get that. Your patient will always say, I just fainted. I just passed out. No, I didn't get any warning. They do usually, in the vast majority of cases, they do. So to help them understand, again, if we go back to the next, go to the next slide, please. You have to go back to this autonomic system. So if you look at where the autonomic system is impacting, your gut, your temperature control, your sweating mechanism, that is why you help your patients understand why feeling hot, feeling sweaty is a sign of hypertension, how they can feel windy or they feel they need the bathroom or they need to have a pee or, you know, they feel they can't breathe or they get chest pain. These are all signs or, you know, they need to have a wee um, or why they wee. When they wee, they can faint. It's, it's understanding, if you understand the autonomic system and how it impacts uh, that system, it helps you help them to understand what they should be looking for and what is, what is a, um, a possible prodromal warning or not. Um, sometimes it's burping, sometimes it's fatigue, sometimes it's a really, really strange thing, but it's, it's unpicking and understanding how it can be a warning. Okay, so I've quickly gone through that. Let's talk about this sort of vasal vagal syncope or these patients that this is where nice guidance stops. Um, you could say, well, orthostatic stress, gravity, I understand all of that, but why do I do it only when I see my mother-in-law or when I visit hospital or when I see my mother and daughter in hospital? You know, what these specific, very specific reasons, if you understand your triggers of why I faint uh, or why I'm, why I'm losing consciousness. Um, and to be honest, it's a, a very, um, if we've gone to the next slide, it's a very poorly understood. We really don't know why the heck we do it uh, fully. Um, it's part of it may be a, a protective mechanism, this fainting goat type of uh, response. You know, the, the rabbit plays dead, the, the fox takes off after what's running around, they wake up and they, they run off in the opposite direction. But as human beings, we're the only humans, we have that, that capacity, but we're the only ones that actually don't just play dead, but we do essentially are dead. And if we had predators, we'd be in trouble. And again, that may be it's postulated that maybe it's the size of our brains or because we don't have um, we don't have many predators that we're able to do that. Um, it could be a problem with baroreceptor response to orthostatic stress. It's either too sensitive or not sensitive enough. Um, I often think there's a cultural or definitely a cultural um, or psychological component, and it's almost like a physical man manifestation of that. Um, or it might be it's one or many different types of syncopes that we're looking at. But again, it's seen as a bit niche and nobody's interested in this 60% really. So why would we bother studying it or, or investing money into finding out, except for the cost of the NHS and the patient? OK, next slide, please, Joe. So even though we don't understand much of it, we, we understand a little bit more on this right hand side we understand how the parasympathetic and the sympathetic side kick in but we don't really understand much about this left hand side how mental stress how a thought a memory a smell um even if you don't even know what the scooby-doo problem is but there's something impacting on us that causes us to withdraw our sympathetic uh, surge and to end up on the floor um we're beginning to get more interested in it, but we don't really understand much of it as yet. The next slide. So, and that's important because that type of syncope is often dismissed as just a teenage girl thing. You'll grow out of it. Uh, nothing to worry about. All the classic in I &E, It's probably a water infection, but you're fine because what the you know the clinician is thinking about. Phew, don't have to worry about no red flag. I can send them home. It's fine. It's not a problem. And you can understand why as clinicians we do that, but it doesn't help the patient. And they will bounce around. And we've had patients that bounce around every A&E 
you know, in London, really just thinking if they next time if they go to a different A and E, they'll get a different answer. Um, and then you've got patients, you know, that who won't be left alone. They're too afraid to go out and shop. They're too afraid to look after, they're not allowed to look after their children because people are scared they're going to collapse on them. It can be really quite devastating in terms of the impact. Okay, so, so, so. so what's going on? Or can we see what's happening? Um, and this withdrawal of this uh, sympathetic search. So again, this is another example of a, of a tilt uh, slot here, tilt uh, trace. And this was a 26 year old chap that got sent to us because we were sometimes the tilt test can help us understand why people are having headaches and chronic headaches for reasons of shock on bore you. So this past chap has never said he never fainted before in his life, but he had these terrible headaches, but he was absolutely terrified of the thought of the, t of the test. And it was nothing I could do really to to try and um, with all my perfect nursing skills, I, I wasn't really helping much. And what you can see here is A is the oscillation in the blood pressure. Um, this is even while he was lying down. But he stands up, it's the tilt up, and his heart rate goes up. But it's all very, can you see the way it's all very zigzaggy? It's all very oscillatory. Um, and then within a couple of seconds, you can just see it just come down. And this is fear. This is, and I see this a lot. And sometimes you can provoke this when you talk to your patients on the tilts. If, uh, and it's just somebody with the patient just says too fearful and the body just says, nope. I'm going to be protective. I'm not going to do this anymore. And I'm going to shut up shop. And you can see the heart rate come down first. And when you're actually doing the tilt, the first thing you're looking for is the heart rate start to drop and the blood pressure collapses with it. You put them down and everything comes back to normal. So this is literally uh, that sort of vasal vagal in action. This patient's never fainted before, but we've managed to trigger it by fear from the, from the, the uh, tilt test. So time is ticking on, so I might just push on. So again, there are different classifications. If you look at the next bit, the different parts of um, of a different part of a faint. So or orthostatic stress. So you've got uh, this part, early part here. Number one is where there's an early stabilization. So you expect a bit of a postural drop, maybe the heart rate goes up, but it should then settle down. And what you should see on a perhaps what should I give you is actually a completely um, normal tilt is a pretty much a very boring straight line for 40 minutes. That's what you, that's what a normal tilt should, should do. But you can see here there's a bit of a, a number one, there's a bit of a, an early stabilization. Then you get this bit of number two, this is this instability. Um, and then really from where the star is, this is like this terminal decline. And this is where if a patient just sits down, you may not have bought a faint. So the patients that just say, yes, I felt terribly, you know, I, I've lost my vision at at this point in number two, uh, I sat down, but I still passed out. That can get translated as they sat down and they passed out. Well, people do pass out when they're sitting down. It happens especially a lot in the, in the elderly. So this is why the devil's in the detail. How much warning were they having for how long? What type? You know, a loss of vision and hearing is quite a late prodromal warning. And therefore, I wouldn't be worried about it if they said, but I still passed out because I was sitting down. Nurse. Or I always sit down and it passes, but it didn't this time. It doesn't necessarily mean uh, that's a red flag. So management, oh, actually, the next slide, next, um, can I have the next one, please? Right, okay. So I'll recap. When we think about how we're going to manage um, the other 60% simply be that, you know, they don't need a pacemaker or the pacemaker won't make a difference. Um, what are we focusing on? Right, well, we need to focus on What's the main cause? Is it orthostatic stress? Is it that they're pooling, for example? Well, if they're pooling because they've got varicose veins, because they're diabetic, because they're very bendy and they're not a member of the Royal Ballet and they're, you know, they're very hypermobile, um, we need to think about medication. Well, not medication, actually, the conservative measures first, and that is let's fill the tank. If we think of a half empty bottle of water being shook around because they're empty, we can certainly, you know, that's not really stable. And also we can fill it up with another quarter for litre inside that when you stand up. So we need to think about ways that we improve that venous return. And so that is increasing your fluids, increasing your salt, sometimes up to 10 grams. We may give patients actually medicate uh, salt tablets in addition to salt earlier in the day. So they don't drink pee, drink pee, drink pee, and then and then have their salt. Um, we think about um, compression types, 
the higher the better. We may think about uh, counter pressure maneuvers where the patients clench their calves and their quads and their buttocks when they stand up or when they're prolonged standing. Think about, they need to think about gravity and think about blood pooling, but that's what they need to focus on fighting that. If they're doing all of that and it's still problematic, then the two drugs we would typically use would be fluticortisone or midodrine. Fluticortisone will do diddly squat if the patient doesn't have enough fluid in the salt. So if they're only drinking half a litre or a litre and not having just having a tiny sprinkle of salt, they're never going to get fluticortisone to work. Um, and we don't use homeopathic doses, so sometimes they're good whack of doses of fluticortisone. But we don't tend to like to use it in the very well in young women, certainly for a long time. The other one which I more prefer is midodrine. Midodrine is a vasoconstrictor, um, so you wouldn't use it. You couldn't use it in patients in men, for example, who've got prostate issues, for example, and you wouldn't use it in women who are thinking of being pregnant or are pregnant. But it's a very short, it's a short acting four hour way of, you know, getting that vasoconstriction, helping people through the commute, maybe or during the day. So but, but it's an add on to conservative measures. Um, we can also think about these isometric counter pressure moves, as I said, tilt training, getting them to increasingly to stand up and to get used to standing in, 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 in uh, time. But also think about what the triggers are. Is the trigger the mother-in-law? Do we know what the trigger is? Is it lack of sleep? Is it um, a trauma that happened 20 years ago and now they've started fainting 15 times a day? They might, might not have been aware of it, but it's asking the question very often. It's where most cardiologists don't go, is trying to figure out what might be going on. Um, and, you know, exploring CBT, meditation, yoga. Uh, and if we go to the next slide, please. OK, so I'm just going to check because I've just gone into the next slide, but the importance is understanding individual triggers and understanding what are we, are we doing something wrong as clinicians first off, then focusing on lifestyle and conservative measures. Education is key to this. There's no point as saying we understand what's going on. They have to understand what's going on. Otherwise, you know, a change is not going to be made and they're going to carry on fainting, hurting themselves um, and, and using resources. Empowerment. We need to empower them to be able to do that. OK. Uh, and that, again, is, is a skill and can be quite difficult because the social part of us uh, don't want to get down on the floor and raise our legs. Drugs, as I said, it's midodrine, fluticortisone, but only it, those drugs will play no role unless we get the education right and change lifestyle very often. Uh, and then more novel things. With, well, novel, we're, we're trying to understand and we're increasingly understanding the relationship between breath training, breath, the heart and how the heart um, talks to the autonomic system and how we can try and retrain the autonomic system by through breath and by changing of uh, HRV and uh, and changes there. I think long COVID has actually um, pushed that forward, those type of, uh, uh, of, of of therapies forward. There's been one blessing in that. It's been that really, I suppose. Um, and other things maybe looking at, I'm just thinking of like smart clothing, the development of T-shirts that can actually pick up changes in venous pooling and blood pressure drops that can actually alert the patient that they need to take action. That might be something particularly uh, relevant to older patients who tend to have not much warning. We tend to lose that warning as we get older. Uh, tragus nerve stimulation of the vagus nerve and uh, novel things. I mean, this is not, it, it, syncope ablation practices is something that we do when they have patients all the time, but it's, it's not uh, recognised fully as a treatment for intractable syncope. But that's something that, again, we have done at the Hammersmith and we are looking to develop our research protocols and um, focus on that. Sorry, I think I've just take, I've just droned on for an hour. So if anybody's not asleep, but hopefully that's um, uh, what I wanted to say. And the final element of this in terms of education, which I've banged on about, we developed just before COVID actually a website called stopfainting.com which was initially aimed at uh, a research project to see how we could, what resources we could give our patients, either before the tilt test or when they came to appointments, or for them to take home with them, if you like. Um, and then COVID hit and we scrapped that because it was our main way that we could communicate and, and help manage patients. Um, but I'd encourage you to have a look. So it's www.stopfainting.com. Um, we are, there's quite a lot of uh, information and resources about fainting, but also about long COVID. 
um, and management strategies for that. And we are looking to um, revamp that as well and make it even more hopefully user friendly for patients who um, will never get to a syncope unit. Thank you. I'm going to have a cup of tea now. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Trish. That's really, uh, really interesting, especially because I, I didn't even know what syncope was yesterday, but managed to follow it pretty well, which is good. Oh, it's more than you'd ever want to know. I know. <laughs> um, guys, does anyone have any any questions? I haven't been able to keep an eye on the chat, so I'll just have a look. But if you want to just stick your hands up or yeah, feel free to come come forwards. It's always very difficult, isn't it, when people are in, in you know, trying to do clinic and, and do what you're doing at other things at the same time. It's yeah. so difficult. <laughs> I don't blame them. It's the sort of thing you need to take and uh... Yeah. Um Do you have a, a link to the website, Trisha, which we can share with the group and I don't uh, I don't have a link. It's just literally if you Google www.stopfainting.com. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, I can look that up and send it out to everybody so everyone's got access to that. Um, guys, is there anyone still still with us? Yes, I'm still here listening. It was very interesting. Thank you. Um, Looking back at previous sessions, if, if nobody has any further questions, I know people have done updates from the, the sites. Is that something which people would find helpful to do uh, today or. Um, yeah, or do you want to call it quits for the for the hour? How are people feeling? The thing is, I would say, Joe, is that I mean, I suppose we just raised a few things. There is. Yeah, there is um, the website has i mean the the man that we saw the you know with the, the half empty hearts and head i mean this is a graphic that we've got off the website so there are plenty of resources there that you might find useful either for yourself or for your patients and feel free you know to use in clinic it's something we use in clinic that we can put up on the screen and just help you know show people what we're trying to uh, explain to them so you know it's it's a resource that we've that, that we understand that you can use and and you just sometimes don't get time to think about how you can how you can explore it for those patients that it might not be, especially with arrhythmia nurses, it's not your main focus when you're trying to do ICD counseling and and everything else. But it's a resource that's useful to know that if you don't have a syncope specialist area in your trust, that it's a resource for you. Brilliant, thanks. And yes, Ernest, I think we we Trish, we are able to share the the slides. You're okay if we send those send those out. So yeah, I can send those with uh, with. The recording and and a link to the to the website as well, where you'd be able to access all those resources. Um, well, yeah, I think in that case, then if nobody has any uh, further questions or or comments, I think we can can leave it there uh, for today. Oh, I can see somebody's. Ah, thank you. Um, but yeah, thank you very much, Trish, for for coming today. Um, and yeah, thank you all for for coming as well. Um, I think Andrea will be in contact with details for the the next um, session. And yeah, as I said, we'll uh, we'll send out the slides and a, a copy of the presentation and uh, sorry, a link to the presentation and the, the website as well. Cool. Brilliant. Well, thanks a lot, everybody. Have a good afternoon, and uh, I'll speak to you soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.